This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Carl Tatz Design, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, and Isotope. You're hearing my voice right now through the Jay-Z pop filter on the Jay-Z BB-29 microphone in a Carl Tatz designed room through the Spectra 1964 STX-600 mic pre complimenter and Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G SSD. So get ready to rock. And the producer said, I feel like I'm sitting next to the drummer and I want to sit next to the pianist. And I was like, I get that. I totally get it. I'm going to do some EQ compression trickery to, to chill out the drums and allow the piano to be more of a focal point. I thought that was just such a beautiful way to put it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. No matter where you like to rock in the galaxy, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron lets you record with confidence over USB-C with up to more than a gigabyte per second of real-world performance. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Find the Envoy Pro Electron and all your OWC storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. I used to have an expensive pop filter for my vocal mic that was so fragile, I had to put a sign on it warning singers not to touch it or else the thing would break, but not anymore. Now I've got this super durable pop filter from jayzmic.com that sounds fantastic. I don't have to worry about stuff breaking and can focus on making music. Go ahead, grab my pop filter. I dare you. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS and get 20% off the amazing pop filter at jayzmic.com. Howdy, Rockstar. Are you ready to discover the secrets to making your mixes sound professional no matter what your studio situation? Then check out my free mixing course, MixMasterBundle.com, where I show you how to get pro-sounding mixes in your DAW using simple techniques and free plugins. And when you're ready for more advanced studio skills, then check out Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can learn from Grammy-winning teachers to help you record, edit, mix, and master your best record ever. Use the code ROCKSTAR for 10% off for a limited time. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Jessica Thompson, a Grammy-nominated mastering and restoration engineer, audio preservation specialist, and an educator. She has digitized, restored, and revived historic recordings for artists ranging from jazz pianist Errol Garner to blues and folk revolutionary Barbara Dane, from Ethiopian keyboardist Hailu Merigia, if I'm pronouncing that right, to proto-punk band Jack Ruby, from anarcho-punk band Crucifix, to synthesizer legend Pauline Anna Strom. Jessica masters music both new and old and has worked on records for Michael Davies, uh, Flipside, Matthew McNeil, International Dub Ambassadors, Tenno Africa, Occurrence, and many others. She sometimes writes gear reviews for Tape Op magazine and has contributed a chapter on mastering the sonics of historic recording media for the book Music Preservation and Archiving Today. She currently serves also as president of the San Francisco chapter of the Recording Academy, and in her spare time, she likes to ride steel bikes and walk her dog, Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Thanks so much to Ian Brennan for making our introduction. Please welcome Jessica Thompson to Recording Studio Rockstars. Jessica, are you ready to rock, or should I say, are you ready to restore our rock? I am ready to rock and restore. Now, what if we... What if we fail to rock somewhere mid-interview? Can you restore it like in real time while we're doing? Do you think interview? I'm not going to go through this recording and like take out my mouth slaps and slurps and <laughs> anytime I cough, maybe 
run a little EQ over it. Nice, nice. Well, I might have to give you mine too. We'll, we'll make sure that we stay in sync. Well, that's awesome. Well, it's really nice to meet you. And um, I have to say, so of course this comes out later and um, it'll be, you know, somewhere middle of the year, but we're just kind of getting our first spring day here in Nashville. And I was just sitting outside in the sunshine listening to your discography and it is so freaking good. Thank you. This I'm a I'm a big fan of the Afro pop tracks that you have in there, and it just makes me want to listen to it all day long. Yeah, me too. I feel very fortunate that I get to work on those records. Yeah. So give us a little bit of an introduction to who you are in your own words. Um, you know, just kind of maybe give us the condensed version. I think you've been in a number of places. And were you in New York before you were in San Francisco? I was. Um, So yes, I'm a mastering and restoration engineer, and I do work on old recordings and new ones as well. And I have had the really good fortune of working at a couple of amazing studios throughout my career um, with engineers who then became lifelong friends and mentors. But I spent the bulk of my career, maybe most of my 30s, at the Magic Shop in New York City working with Steve Rosenthal. Now that's the studio. the The Magic Shop was the one that had the wraparound console, right? Oh yeah, that gorgeous new console. Was that part of your workflow as well, or would you have been in a totally dedicated, separate room for mastering and restoration? I wish. In fact, <laughs> kind of regret that I didn't spend more time in that room working on that console. But because I was the mastering person, I was downstairs in the mastering room. Right on. The foundation, keeping our yep. foundation strong. Well, um, tell us a little bit about the wraparound console, since I don't believe it. Ex- I don't think the Magic Shop exists now, right? Is that correct? That's correct. The Magic Shop shut down um, not long after I moved to California, and it was a real heartbreak. But times change, rents go up. The music industry had changed so much um, over the years. So Steve decided to shut down the recording portion of the studio, and um, I'm actually not sure where that console wound up. I feel like it was something like Iowa, but I'm not sure. But I think it is still intact, so someone is still working on that that beautiful console. Um, And that was a Neve, right? But it was sort of went around you. You could just sit in the middle of it. I believe it had been at the BBC at some point. Can you imagine um, being at the BBC, like just running a broadcast on that console? Or then I swear, Steve told me once that it um, had been in maybe like a hospital, like they were using it to page the doctors, like (laughs) channels one and two. Dr. Thompson, we need you in the OR. Um, There you go. Again, these wonderful stories that I personally uh, have not fact-checked. Sorry, was it was it sort of like um, 1073 style modules? What, what, how would you describe what kind of an Eve console it was? Um, I used to know the exact model. It was commissioned, I think, in 1970, and I couldn't tell you that much more about it because, again, like great regret of my career. I was so used to it just being there that. I didn't think about it that much because I was downstairs working on tape machines and working with my mastering gear. And it's just one of those things where like when you are in the middle of it, you don't always realize um, the beautiful things that you have at your fingertips that you should not take for granted. But well, you know, I we did. L- here at Recording Studio Locks, Rockstars, we, we like to begin with regrets first, you know, on the interview, of course. But I mean, well, you know, the real question, just is, look, look who's rocking now, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so where are you now? You're in San Francisco. Yeah, well, I'm not in San Francisco proper, but I am in the Bay Area. And I moved out here to be closer to family. Um, my husband's family's out here. We had two little kids. We had a tiny Brooklyn apartment. So the writing was on the wall for us. We knew it was time to make a lifestyle change. Um, So I came out here and um, just dove into the Bay Area music scene. 
How would you describe the Bay Area music scene? Uh, dormant for the past year, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, no, it's what really about cool. when it's, it's like, not dormant? <laughs> when it's not dormant, I mean, okay, so obviously living in New York City, I went to shows all the time and I saw some amazing performances at the, you know, premier venues of the world, Radio City and Carnegie Hall and, you know, the rock clubs. Like I used to go to this club Southpaw in my neighborhood a lot or the Bell House. And that was like just such an integral part of living in New York. Yeah, But I moved out here, and I will tell you, two of my top 10 shows I've ever experienced have been in the past few years in the Bay Area. And they're, um, there's a huge range of genres and kinds of shows that you can seek out and find. And, for example, I oh, I was so lucky because someone gave me a ticket to this. I got to hear Lori Anderson performing Lou Reed's Guitar Drones at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Wow. And if you can just imagine a space like that reverberating with guitar feedback, it was utterly magnificent. That's awesome. You know, I had a funny Lori Anderson story. <laughs> I was traveling and I was in <laughs> Paris and I had seen that she was going to, this is many years ago, 91, I think. And I saw she was coming to Paris and I was so excited. And I bought a ticket and I did, you know, I traveled around Europe and then came back to Paris for my show and I had gotten the month wrong. So there was no show and I missed the whole oh, thing. Oh, and you missed it. Yeah. I was like, I was so ready for, oh, Superman. Yeah. So and that have, happened to me you, with suicidal tendencies once. I, I showed up a day later and missed the show. Yeah. Are you are you very into art rock and experimental music and, and um, things of that nature? Well, yeah. In terms of my personal taste, um, my gateway into this work was as a college radio DJ. Uh -huh. So that's where I first got my fingers on tape machines and consoles, dating where myself the, a little bit. That we where had all the cool machines, kids but, hang out and don't get any I sleep. I don't know if it was the cool kids, but... Um, yeah, that's when I was uh, first playing all sorts of crazy records on my late night radio shows. So, you know, that opened my ears to all of the different sounds that could be sculpted and created with all the gear we have at our fingertips. What, what college were you at? I went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut, WESU. Okay. All right, cool. Um, and... <laughs> I don't know what I don't know how much we want to talk about the college radio station kind of vibe, but what were some of the tools that you were using back then that you either aren't using today or that you're still using today for what you do? Okay, so I swear this doesn't really date me. It's just the fact that the radio station had not updated gear in so long, but we had an Otari tape machine and wow. we would create our station promos by mixing down stuff on the tape on this two track tape machine. And um, that's where I learned to cut tape. Quarter inch? Yep, quarter inch. Um, there was a first internship I did was with somebody who was doing, um, you know, jingles and things like that and voiceovers. And it was all, a bunch of it was still done on quarter inch tape. And this would have been same, this would have been like early 91 or something like that, 92. And, um, one of the tricks that he did that I that I still remember to this day was he would put a every time he did the talk back it would play a hundred hertz tone underneath his voice a little hum so that when you were speeding the tape by whizzing it by the tape heads looking for different sections of the tape where you'd recorded stuff you'd hear that as a a high pitch tone so that you'd know to stop right there because we were just hitting a new section. <laughs> Clever. Clever indeed, right? Yeah. Um, well, so cool. So now you are still working with tape today, probably, right? And uh, you work with vinyl, old records, new records. Um, tell us more about what you do today. I do a lot of large-ish scale archiving, not not on the magnitude of some of like the, the big shops with dozens of technicians and machines, but um, I work a lot with like 
an individual who has a couple hundred tapes or a small label or a small venue who's got a thousand recordings over a 20 or 30 year history. And I will, this is like one slice of my workflow. I, I will help them create a really detailed inventory and then go through the process of digitizing and preserving all the audio. So that's one slice. And then I work with a lot of reissue labels who are trying to put out these records that fell through the cracks or haven't been reissued in a long time. And that's where I get random tapes or vinyl LPs or cassettes or dats, like just whatever is left of this recording. And I digitize those and figure out which source is going to be our best one and then remaster those for release. Ooh, so if we have all kinds of dat tapes from, you know, the 90s that it would be great to get digitized and make sure they sound great, you'd be the right person to call. Oh, I'd be one of them, but <laughs> uh, not my favorite of the historic You're not your formats. own favorite person? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, oh, I meant that Dad's not, dad, dad's not my favorite. <laughs> all um, right, groovy. If you do have them, I know someone in Nashville I can connect you with. I do have them, and I had a... a Tascam DA30 was actually my first audio equipment that I bought when I was in audio school. I was like, I'm going to get a DAT machine, <laughs> you know? And uh, the last time I tried to get it going and just transfer a DAT, I, I don't even think the, the drawer opens on the DA30 anymore, you know? That thing just fell to pieces. Oh, they're tricky, aren't they? Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's keep talking about what you're doing now. So, you know, you're doing restoration. You might take an old copy of a vinyl record that needs to get digitized. Um, there's a great YouTube video that we can include in the show notes too that you did for Evergreen Music where you really kind of explain your process a little bit. Um, so I may ask you some questions around that. But you're, you know, you're sort of finding older recordings and you can bring them into the digital domain, but you also clean things up and do what we might consider... Um, you know, sort of modern mastering at the same time. Not not modern, but just what you would do if somebody just showed up with a mix. You do some of that as well. Yeah. And people show up with mixes and I master their records too. So Yeah. Yeah. But I, I guess what I'm getting at is um yes, yes, uh mastering from people's mixes in that traditional sense. But even if we somebody brings in an old recording, that may involve both elements of the process, right? Like yeah, both that's, cleaning that's up totally and mastering. True. Well, what uh, what do you love about doing that? I love the mystery and the time travel. You know, when like a package shows up and there's like a dusty tape in it that hasn't been played back in 50 years. And I get to be the one to put it up on the tape machine and hit play and find out what's there. And sometimes it is just mind blowing. And then sometimes it's total crap. And you don't you don't mm. know what you're going to get. Um, so when it is total crap, what do you do? <laughs> uh, search for another source. I'm talking not in terms of the musical content. I mean, like the quality of the recording or right, how it has right. survived over the years. But, you know, I had this happen just last week. I had a tape and, um, the label thought it was a master tape, but I'm pretty sure it was not. It, it, was almost certainly a, some sort of copy that got made along the way. And I, it wasn't in great shape, and it sounded awful. It was really wobbly and um, had a lot of speed problems. So I had a cassette, digitized the cassette. Cassette was a little better, but it still didn't sound great. So I got them to send me a pretty mint copy of the LP, and I digitized that. By the way, uh, by this time, I'm very familiar with the recording. Yeah. And the, L the LP was it. The LP was solid. It ha didn't have the speed problems. Um, you know, it had some clicks and pops, but those are easy enough to remediate. So we wound up remastering this album from the LP. Wow. And so, yeah, I guess instinctively we might think, oh, the LP mo was made from something else, so we have to go backwards. But that's not always the case. You just... Uh, you can make something sound great from whatever the best version of it is. Yeah, that's totally true. And then I had a similar project where I had a cassette and the LP, and the cassette sounded way better. The LP was just a bad pressing. Yeah. I'm a big fan of cassettes. I mean, 
I really, honestly, I kind of miss the the whole window of time, which for me would have been the, you know, the '90s through. When did we stop listening to cassettes and cars? Was that? I guess we would have switched to CDs in the early to mid two thousands. But um, you know, printing mixes to cassette and then taking the cassette out for the car jam to see what you thought was so much fun. And it, you got like yeah. it was like you got bonus compression just because it was on cassette on cassette. Totally. And um, mixtapes. I bet you miss mixtapes. You know, I never got deep into mixtapes. I wasn't that cool kid who who made a mixtape for the girl and, you know, won her won her heart that way. Um, like some of my friends. And and also, but I did have a college radio um show my freshman year. So I I would have gotten invited invited to the party with you. That's good. We could have partied <laughs> together. Yeah, in fact, college radio was the demise of my math, uh, you know, my possible mathematics career because the, my math class was at noon on a Friday, but I had the 12 p.m. to 4 a.m. slot for the college radio station on Thursday, Thursday nights, so I never made it to math class on time, <laughs> and that was oh, the end of that. yep. That's tough. You got your priorities straight, though. That's right. Um, well, tell us a little bit about, you know, what your studio looks like. Uh, what kind of tools do you surround with yourself with? And if you're sitting in your studio now, what are you looking at? I am in my studio right now. So um, it's been, I've had some ups and downs since I moved to the Bay Area, and it's been kind of uh, rockier than I wish it had been. But part of that is COVID related. Um, for a while, I was sharing a studio space with Piper Payne. And oh, Piper yeah, has, cool. Yeah, Piper has since moved to Nashville although she still keeps a foot in the Bay Area. But when COVID hit and I was not able to access the studio anymore, I set up at home and I took over a big room in our house. Sorry, kids. I took one of their right. one of the rooms that was going to be a room for my kid and um, treated it and uh, bought a bunch of acoustic uh, treatment and bass traps set up my console. I've got some ATCs I'm working off of. I've got an ATR tape machine, nice rack of playback gear, cassette decks and turntable and DAT players, and my analog chain for mastering. And here I am in the back of my house. Well, we might as well talk about that for just a minute since so many people are trying to set up their own home studios and make them work well. Um, What's the size of the room that would work for something like that? I dream of a room that is more like 16 by 20. And this room is a little small. Um, okay. I'm actually talking to architects right now because I have I've uh, faced reality at last and recognized that you got to build out at home and I have to pay to do it and I have to pay to do it right. Because um, renting in the Bay Area, as in so many markets, is just untenable. With the the way the music industry is going and the inconsistency in income, I just can't commit to renting a studio space. Mm -hmm. I need like my space that I can access all the time, especially now because I have kids and my kids are home 24-7. So... Someone's got to be here. Yeah. With so many game-changing Isotope plugins to choose from, deciding which one to buy next could be a bit of a challenge. But did you know that now you can have all their plugins through Isotope's new affordable subscription bundle, Music Production Suite Pro, for only $19.99 per month? Get your Rockstar extended 30-day free trial subscription now at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Do you need to record direct stereo keyboards? Spectra 1964 now offers the Stereo BBDI 2 with custom wound high Z transformers for big headroom, virtually flat response, and a 15 dB input pad. The Spectra 1964 BBDI Passive Direct Box is also perfect for recording deep bass that will make your mixes sound huge. Plug that into a C610 comp limiter, and as founder Bill Cheney points out, it'll move your pant leg. 
Get your sound moving at spectra1964.com. Well, so um, you you picked a, the room that works, so it might be a little smaller than ideal. Um, talk to us about some of the really dumb basic choices that we need to think about when we set up in a room like that. So, for example, which wall do you put the speakers on? And, wh- and what's important to consider as far as where you place the speakers in the room? Yeah, well, it's a rectangle with a sloped roof. The sloped roof actually turned out to be kind of a good thing. Better than the sloped floor. Yes, <laughs> it is better. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm situated long ways and my speakers are where the roof is lower and then the roof line rises um, behind me. So the speakers and, are on the shorter of the width wall, not the length wall. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. I had to visualize it for a minute. Um, and I used Sonar Works to help me tune the room a little bit. I actually don't use the Sonar Works like EQ correction. I used it to help me understand what was happening in the room so I could adjust the speaker position and put up some different treatment and even adjust my listening position a little bit, just trying to optimize the accuracy of what I was hearing. Wow. How, what are some things that would allow you to do that? I mean, I have used sonar works and in my experience, you, you take the mic and you move around all these different spots. Oh, I see. Because it does give you a readout graph of what the response of your speakers are. Yeah. So it gives you that. Then I also used room EQ wizard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that one was, was totally fun to play around with. And again, one of those areas where I just feel a huge lack of knowledge and such respect for acousticians and um, acoustic designers who really know this stuff. But with Room EQ Wizard, at least I could look at the readout and say, oh, I see what's going on here. I need to put some treatment up here, or I'm going to add another bass trap over there, um, move my speakers a little bit forward. You know, they're not they're not up against the wall. There's, there's uh, like... My listening position is kind of in the middle of the room, mm. um, and that's just what wa- that's what wound up working best. So, yeah. this is it for now until I uh, bite the bullet and start construction. So, uh, let me back up if you don't mind, and and if I put you on the spot for any of these, just just say pass, you know. But <laughs> but when you when you talk about you know, using these tools and then saying, oh, this this could use some bass. The tools are telling me I could use some bass trapping, um, for example. What would you see in, in the uh, readout of these tools that might indicate you should use some bass trapping? Well, if you can see a really big bump somewhere, like 70, 100, you just know there's something's bouncing around the room and building up in a way that if you were listening to music would indicate oh, this song's super bassy or, you know, has this crazy low-end bump. And um, just throwing in the bass traps helps remediate that a little bit. Right. Okay. And then what? Uh, what is a bass trap? So what? Uh, I don't know which ones you ended up using, but what might a bass trap look like for somebody? Well, mine are tan and triangular <laughs> and filled with a bunch of stuff. I got them yeah. from Vicoustic, and uh, I have four of them. And they're very pretty. I'm not good with the the insides. Okay. I actually wrote a review of this stuff for Tape Op. Oh, and cool. I learned so much in that process. But it's true. Like I called up Vicoustic and was like, help. Yeah, I don't but that's know what I need. That's good um advice to the rock stars. It's just, you know, that reminder, like, just go to the website, call, call, you know, there's specialists who make these traps and they make panels for your studio and order them. You don't have to build everything yourself all the time, you know. Oh, yeah. And that was part of it, too, because I am a busy person. I am constantly working. I have kids, and I did not have time to build my own bass traps or acoustic panels, even though, like, conceptually, I get it. I know that I could have gone out and bought wood and some Owens Corning and put something together. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was much easier to call Vicoustic and say, help me sort this out. And they said, here's what you should do. I sent them measurements of the room and everything. And um, they said, here's what you should do. And they sent me a couple pallets of stuff, and I hung it on the walls. 
Okay, cool. Now, was there something that you saw in the Sonarworks or Rumi Q Wizard readout that indicated to you, oh, I need to put a panel on the wall or on the ceiling? Is there something we would notice about that? Is it more just like we'd see crazy comb filtering before and then that gets smoothed out with the panel? Some of that. But at that point, it was really mostly what I was hearing. Because, you know, I've worked in some really great rooms, so I know what a good, well-tuned room sounds like. And I know what my ATC monitors sound like. So I would pull up a song that I'm very familiar with, one of my favorite go-tos for reference listening, and I would listen to it. And you could tell, like, if the stereo image felt a little off or if you moved your head around a bit and things really dipped in and out frequency-wise, that's when I could tell, okay, I got to figure this out. What do I need to do? Or the gummy bears kicking in, one of the two. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Could be Uh, that. All right. So, well, that's cool. So, so you got all set up there. Now, what are some other considerations for you? So, so there's the monitoring so that you can work and make good decisions. But then for you, there's also like setting up a turntable so that you can have these tools that you rely on. In my experience, um, you know, not, not as experienced with turntables. There have been these times where I've like thought, oh, I'm going to hook up my turntable. I set it on something, get it hooked up to the speakers put on a record and I walk over to sit on the couch and just, you know, two steps into it and the thing's bad, the needle's bouncing all over the place and it's skipping. Are there any just basic considerations we need to know as far as what might or might not work for where you can put a turntable in a room? Yeah, totally. Well, it's not so much where in the room, but on what, and then Mm -hmm. how it's calibrated and how you set the tracking force for whatever stylus you're using. But, um, I, you know, I literally use a level to level my turntable. Um, I have a Technics 1200. I actually have two of them. I'm very fortunate in that regard. And Those both are classics. Of have, classic, right? Both of them have been modified by KAB, which is this company in New Jersey where you can just do like a laundry list of mods to achieve sort of a super machine. So like... I get the hi-fi world, the audiophile world, and I get $10,000 turntables and styli and like gold cables or whatever. But at the end of the day, I just want something that is rock solid that I Mm -hmm. can trust. And that's what I love about the 1200s, um, especially with the modifications. So I just you can scratch on them, right? Oh, God, I I would never. no, but it's like, it's level. I have like a silicon gel that my tone arm thing rests in. So it minimizes vibrations. I had the power supply taken out and, and I have a separate power supply for it. I had everything rewired. So, you know, just these small things you can do. And then you wind up with a turntable that when I turn it on, it's exactly what I need it to be. What was the name? It was KAB. Was that the name of the company that That's modified? That's right. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, hearing you talk about it, it's it reminds me a little bit of with my 24-track tape machine, uh, aligning it before a session and stuff. There's an element of like getting everything just in balance and then go time for music. And I imagine that, you know, hearing you describe how to transfer vinyl to digital, uh, obviously a big part of your expertise is making sure that the mechanics of the vinyl playback is really, really doing the right thing so that you get the very best source before it even goes into the computer. Yeah. And the stylus. Oh my God. I bought a new stylus last year. I had a good one. I had a really good one before, but I knew that it was getting on in years and hours and it was time to think about replacing it. So I bought one and I bought a really nice Ortofon stylus. And when I turned it, or when I uh, installed it, kind of broke it in a little bit, I was so both like horrified and ecstatic about how good it sounded. Horrified because I was like, I need to go redo everything I did last year <laughs> on vinyl. Um, and in fact, I actually did. I I had fairly recently digitized and remastered something from vinyl, but I hadn't sent it off yet. Like. Literally, like the day before I got the stylus, I'd finished this project. Got the new stylus. It sounded so good that I hit pause on that project, broke it in, 
re-digitized the record, remastered the whole thing, sent it off, and it was worth it. So breaking it in, when you say that, I mean, it kind of reminds me of the idea of breaking in a new pair of headphones. Sometimes you have to sort of burn in the drivers. And a stylus is a form of a driver, right? It's a, it has a solenoid. Well, is it a solenoid that's in there? Is that the right term? I don't know. I don't know if that's the right term, but maybe. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's got a coil. There's a moving coil element to a stylus, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. So I guess maybe that when you, when you say break it in, what are the things that happen or that you hear as a difference as you break it in? Uh, you know, at first it's, um, it's a little, maybe a little bright or zingy. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you can think about like the tip and how it gets worn after it runs through grooves for a few dozen hours or however long. So, um, you know, the first few records I played, I thought were a little zingy. Mm-hmm. And then by the time I'd played a bunch of records and had some fun listening, it started to just chill out a little bit. I think that's the same thinking behind breaking in a new pair of headphones. People have said sometimes you'll just plug the headphones in and just play music for hours and then come back and listen on them. I yeah. think it's just the high end sort of smooths out a little bit. Yeah. And I did that. I bought a pair of speakers not too long ago and I had to just play music real loud for a while before they they broke in. I like doing that anyway. Yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, speaking of which, listening volume, how much of a how important of a thing is that for you to be considering while you're working? I am so consistent. Uh, I listen when I'm mastering, I pretty much listen consistently at the same uh, settings through my converters. And then obviously, I can tell if things are louder or quieter, depending on genre or um, where it's at in the mastering process. But I listen really consistently because that's how I know my place. Like, that's how I know where I am. Then I don't get fooled. You know, when you're listening really loudly and you're like, this sounds amazing. Yeah. And then you turn it down to a more reasonable level and you're like, what was I doing? <laughs> The first time I heard a Carl Tatz Phantom Focus mix room featuring his PFM HD 1000 series monitors, I was completely blown away. It was like listening to three-dimensional sound with rock solid bass all the way down to 20 hertz. It was really incredible. What's amazing is that a Phantom Focus system can be implemented in your existing control room or even bedroom studio, giving you world-class sound for mixing. Go see how cool your studio could look and sound at phantomfocus.com. What are some techniques that allow you to be consistent with listening? Is it literally like you set the volume knob and you don't adjust it from there? Is it measuring SPLs in the room? Is it not? Does it not require that being being that high tech about it? I set the levels. Um, I, I don't turn the knob. Which knob? And which knob don't you turn? I don't turn the volume knob. Okay. Uh, and I do, I have an SPL meter that I consult occasionally, but I, I kind of just know it. Like you can feel it, right? And I listen to reference tracks all the time. So if I pull up a reference track, I know where it should sit loudness wise mm-hmm. in my room. And if you find an appropriate loudness for the room, I guess if, you, if you're a little too loud, it begins to resonate the room more, right? And you start hearing the anomalies of the room and they start playing into the picture more. Is that a fair comment yeah, to make? I think or? that's fair. Um, I will say in this room, I rely on my headphones more than I have in other rooms. Uh-huh. And that's just a practicality of how we're working these days. Yeah. What headphones do you choose to wear? I have the Odyssey um, LCD X's. Cool. Those things, I, I don't know all the models super well, but I did get to listen to the Odysseys when I was at NAM, and I was very impressed with the way they sounded. Well, I borrowed a pair from Matt Boudreaux. Oh, Matt. And, Our yep. buddy Matt. Hey, Matt. And I did not want to give them back. So I nice. had to buy a pair. Um, so you guys are in the same neck of the woods. We are. Rockstars, if you don't know Matt Boudreaux already, you need to go listen to Working Class Audio. That is his fantastic show. He's my brother from another podcast. 
And I believe, Jessica, you've already been on Matt's show before, too. Yeah, I was on his show a couple of years ago. I right, rode my cool. bike over the hills to his house. Was that a steel that bike? It was a steel bike. <laughs> so it's extra heavy, so you must have strong legs. I did back then, man. I, I've lost it since the pandemic because I used to have to ride my bike to the studio or to the school where I taught or basically everywhere, and now I don't go anywhere. Well, it's just a reminder to us how important it is to balance our studio life, which can it can involve a lot of sitting in chairs um, to uh, to you know to moving around physically, moving our bodies as much as possible. Yeah, the the dog walking is good for that too. You yeah, take care of your dog. Eddie? Yes. Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Eddie. Um, you also teach, right? Well, tell us about some of the teaching that you do and, uh, and where you do that. I do. I teach at SAE Expression in Emeryville, and I teach the mastering class, and I teach the capstone class, which is really my favorite because that's second semester seniors getting ready to graduate and seek careers, and they have this one class to do a substantial audio project. So planning, execution, revising, rescoping, deliverables, we go through all of it. And I will get a class of five students and five completely different projects that I get to help um, mentor them through. And it's just incredibly rewarding to hear what what they come up with at the end, to hear all the different phases of production and revision. Very cool. And uh, it's probably pretty fun to hear when they really get things to sound great. Um, yeah. I love I being mean, How rewarding the... is that? You know, they start off with just yeah. this idea, and then they wind up with something really substantial. Yeah. Well, I have interns at my studio, and I'm I'm constantly amazed by them because – it can be it can be sort of funny how an intern can show up at the studio and and on the surface really not know anything yet you know and and kind of in a glaring way sometimes just with some basics and then they'll turn around and like pick up an instrument and play something for you and you're like holy shit that's you you sound amazing you know yeah. and it's just that reminder that like we all come from a music a love of music background so we're at whatever stage we're in even if we don't know how to do something yet we wouldn't be here if we didn't already, you know, have a strong appreciation and love for music itself and be great at some aspect of it. Exactly. Um, well, very cool. So we've got a few topics I thought I might jump to. Uh, why don't you, if you don't mind, give us the short version of the stuff that you talked about in that video explaining how to set up a turntable. You you mentioned leveling the turntable uh, but there's a few more stages to getting a re record ready to transfer. Yeah, sure. I feel so weird about that video because it was a long time ago and so much has changed since then. Really? And also, okay. I, I think I was like nine months pregnant when we shot that video. <laughs> <laughs> you did not know it. I had no idea. Um, I think we shot some before and some after the baby was born. So it was a uh, quite a, a hectic time in my life. Um Anyway, I feel like, you know, some of the turntable stuff is pretty basic. I level it with a level. I make sure that my four little turntable legs are optimized so my platter spins um, flat. And this um, is I have, literally, you could just take a level and set I it on the level. platter. Yep. Um, I have a couple of those calibration records. Uh, I have a new one, but I also have some like from the 60s, like calibrate your turntable. And they help you set up the anti-skate. And they help you like they're for um they're for like home hi-fi setups. So they'll tell you if your speakers are out of phase, like if you've got wires crossed. Um, obviously not a problem in the studio, but it's it's fun to listen to them. It's yeah. a great demonstration of what phase sounds like. And um, it will also uh, just help you understand that, like, the stylus is installed correctly. It's riding in the groove properly. You'll hear if you're getting distortion in one channel or the other. Um, I always set my tracking force depending on which stylus I'm using. And ideally, when you do that, you drop the needle in the groove and you get what you're supposed to get. Right on. And setting the tracking force, there, at least in the video, there was an element of the needle 
it's the weight. It's like the counterbalance weight at the other end of the the needle yeah. arm, right? Yeah. You're going to have to forgive my butchering of vinyl terminology, but it's okay because somebody's listening to this and they're new to this too. Um, so you've got that counterweight, but then you also have, isn't the tracking, um, isn't there like one where it's pulling in or out or am I, or is that not true? Is it just riding wherever the groove takes it? Well, the anti-skate would help figure out if your um, tone arm is pulling in or out. Right. See, it's funny. Like, I feel like I'm butchering this stuff too. And some audiophile is, is going to listen to this and then call me up and be like, well, don't you know? And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I just, I trust my ears. I run records with tones on them. And then you know what I really do? I play back a record that where I did the digital masters. Um, I didn't cut the vinyl, but I play back a record that I worked on and I compare it to my masters and make sure that the left-right balance is spot on and that it sounds good. That's what I do. Yeah, and I would say to those um, audiophiles that there is a playlist of your music, Jessica, in the show notes of this episode. So just scroll down and go listen to her jams because they are awesome. And that should, <laughs> that should end that argument pretty quickly. <laughs> um, but there's also a process of I think you go through cleaning the needle and then there's like a, a cleaning the vinyl itself, right? Do you want do you want to talk a little bit about the stuff that we're running into in that department? Oh yeah, I do have a wet vac record cleaner. And um this is another one of those things where it's like you can spend $20 to clean your records or $8,000 and I'm in the middle somewhere. Nice. Closer to 20 than 8,000, but um I have a solution that I spray on the record made from Turgitol and I uh, get the record nice and wet, run it through my wet vac. It comes out looking nice and clean and beautiful. Um, I do use a little stylus cleaner thing on the my Ortofon stylus just to make sure there's no dust or other crap building up on the stylus. And it's pretty simple and straightforward. Like, I just kind of do that when I play a record. Cool. So everything's clean. It's all, you know, there's nothing between the needle and the and the vinyl and everything's set up on there. And it just sounds great transferring. Well, cool. That's, that's the idea. Now, what are some of the tools that you might reach for next? Uh, in the video, I saw that you had like a, a Daking compressor. Um, and also, Jeff's going to be on the podcast after this. So if you've got any questions for him, now's the time to <laughs> to ask me so to ask cool. him. cool. I have to tell you, I sold that compressor. Oh, I kind of miss Jeff. it. I, I kind of miss it. I actually really liked it. It was just, I used it super gently, but I really liked the way it sounded. Or the right way it sounded. Um, but, but compression is part of your process. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel like compression and EQ is pretty much part of every mastering chain uh, to greater or lesser extents. Um, I sold that Day King and I got the Iron SPL compressor. And then I sold that compressor and bought the Iron SPL compressor plugin. Actually, mm. I, first I bought the plugin, did a little shootout and decided uh, I was quite happy with how the plugin sounded. Cool. Um, I, I have a Manly Massive Passive EQ that I love. That was the second EQ I ever bought. The first EQ I bought was the Dangerous Bax. So right. What is a, what is a Bax EQ? Is that does that short for Baxendall? Yes. And can this you explain was, what a Baxendall EQ is? Um, oh, you put me on the spot like I'm teaching class or something. Uh, well, um, or you know, even if it's just sort of describing what knobs we're going to see. <laughs> Well, rather than being uh, a parametric or a shelf, it's just these, I think of them as like big loping uh, gentle curves. And I think of it as a way to tip things into balance. So if a mix comes in and it's just feeling a little dark, you can do this beautiful high-end boost that just sort of lifts everything. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if it's feeling a little wussy, I can do a little low-end boost and give it some some guts. It's sort of like the tilt EQ idea. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and totally. I know if a lot of um, people probably have, are familiar with like the Fab Filter multiband, which might have um, parametric EQs, filters, but there's also that tilt feature that you can use. Oh, which, yeah. Uh, I use similar. the Fab Filter ones too, but I don't think I've 
ever use the tilt feature. I, you know, I never do either. <laughs> I just know it's there. Huh. Right on. Okay, cool. The STX100D from the Spectra 1964 Custom Shop is the big brother to the now famous STX100, a fully discrete mic pre with dual transformer isolated Spectra 101 amplifiers. The STX100D is exactly the same original circuit found in Stax, Arden, AdVision, A&M, and Record Plant recording consoles. The sonic performance is identical. Best of all, it will plug into a single space of your standard 500 lunchbox. And if you want to add the sound of the famous Spectra C610 complimenter? Then check out the new STX600 modules, combining the STX100 mic pre and C610 complimenter in a single 500 module. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio that worked for famous producers like Tom Dowd with the STX mic pre's, BBDI, and complimenters. Go to spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. One of the challenges for recording your voice is getting close enough to the microphone that you get a great bass boost proximity effect without getting blasts of wind on the microphone. Try this experiment. Hold your hand in front of your mouth and say, peanut butter popcorn. Feel that blast of air on your hand? That will cause a terrible sound on your microphone called a plosive. My favorite way to avoid this is to use the Jay-Z microphone pop filter in front of a mic. This thing is built like a tank with a flexible metal arm that I can clamp directly onto the mic stand. It has a super cool waveguide design that looks like ripples on water and prevents the plosives getting through to the mic no matter how explosive the voice gets. Plus, it lets the high frequencies through for superb clarity on the mic. Get your vocals just right and use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 20% off the amazing pop filter at jzmike.com. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Jessica Thompson, joining us from her studio in the Bay Area to talk about mastering and restoration. Jessica, are you ready to jam? Can you restore the rock so that we can jam? I guess that's the question. The rock is restored. Thank you. Was that just a single button that you get to push for for bringing the rock back? Yeah, just you know, restore. Boop. There you go. That's. The, I want that job in the studio. You know, actually, yeah. I have to say, thinking about you, what you do, and listening to your discography, which a reminder, Rockstars, that's in the show notes. Just click through, and you can go listen to all these records. Um, but you do. You've done so much great Afro pop and stuff. And maybe I'm just a big fan of that, but I was listening to it and I just felt like I could so easily just get lost in the music. And some of the tracks are longer too, right? They're not, they're not always like three and a half minute, you know, three minute songs. Do you sometimes find it challenging to not just get lost in what you do? Feel like you have to, you know, you're supposed to be pushing a button somewhere? I do get lost in what I do, but usually when I'm in work mode. When I get lost, that's how I know I'm done. Like, that's how I know I've achieved what I set out to achieve sonically. Because I'm not nice. thinking about, like, turning knobs or fiddling with plugins. I'm just lost in the music. That's a good way to, to uh, know that's a sign. I've had other guests on the show talk about, um, you know, how do you know when the production or the mix is done? And sometimes the answer is, you know, you just start you just start feeling the music in the studio and you're getting into it. Yeah. And yeah. you don't feel the need to tweak anything. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's pivot. And I want to ask you, there's a couple of topics that I know you um, had some thoughts on, but one of them, especially when you're dealing with restoration is the idea that there's something wrong with this thing and you have to restore it or you have to remove noise and stuff like that. So, this question is just, you know, noise, what is it? And why are we always trying to remove it? I know. I could talk about noise all day. It's my favorite topic. Because, you know, so much of what we do as music creators is capture sounds and then sculpt those sounds and arrange those sounds. And what's getting in our way? Noise? Is that, is that what we think of? Uh, the, the stuff that prevents us from communicating the way we're trying to communicate with sound. Is that what we consider noise? 
But at the same time, like, good question. What is it that makes our musical creations more than just frequencies or timbres or ones and zeros? You know, it it is the noise. It's the sound of a room or the sound of the gear or the sound of a tape or, um, you know, the the kind of corporeal body sounds that we make when we touch an instrument or we sing. So that's what makes it real. So I'm constantly playing with this tension of like, I love noise. I remove noise. How much noise should I remove? How much does the noise inform what this recording is? Well, so let's talk about synthesis for just a minute. I don't know if you ever studied subtractive synthesis, additive synthesis, um, but if you, when you first learn synthesis, you learn that there's different waveforms and you can create a tone and now you've got a sine wave and it sounds pretty cool, but then you begin to add harmonics to it and now all of a sudden it takes on certain tones or, or, you know, even just the idea, you know, question comes up on the podcast a lot is, you know, how do you make it so that you can hear an 808 kick drum? Well, you add distortion to it, you know, you add noise to it. Um, but then if you, if you trimmed off the beginning of a piano note, this is like one of those classic demonstrations in a synth class and, and played it, you wouldn't necessarily identify it as a piano but as soon as you hear the noise of the attack of the hammer, it becomes identifiable as, oh, that's a piano string being hit. And you've got like noises that become the part of the bow um, bowing on a violin or the pick and the, the plectrum on a guitar. I just wanted to say the word plectrum, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like noise is a very integral part of creating the sound and creating the music and creating the expression. And it's interesting because what you're talking about is it's, is it just kind of reminds us it extends beyond the obvious into like all the aspects of the gear and the recording and the space in the room. Yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes it has to do with the, the, the realness of a physical or an acoustic instrument or performance, but it exists in digital productions too, just in a different form. But like, I'll give you an example. I think about mouth noise all the time because as a mastering engineer, I'm constantly taking out like lip smacks and saliva sounds and excessive sibilance, which is all I hear when I talk right now because I just said excessive sibilance, right? Are you going to take out any of <laughs> this stuff right here? <laughs> but... In, in like a really emotionally heart-wrenching vocal performance, you want to hear those like big gulpy breaths. And you yeah. might want to hear a little bit of a lip smack, something that feels like close and real and like a little unhinged. But then in a different style of music or a different type of performance, I will take out every mouth smack because it sounds like a tick or a pop or a bad edit. Yeah. Now, quick question for you. Has that been exacerbated by the digital process and recording into Pro Tools and things like that? Did that used to be less of a problem when we were staying analog? Quick answer, yes. I think so. I've always had a theory that, you know, when I first learned how to go in and edit out mouth sounds in Pro Tools, for example, and you zoom way in close and you see this crazy looking spiky thing, and, you know, part of me goes, I, this looks to me like digital not knowing what to do with the high frequency sound. Hmm. I don't do it in Pro Tools anymore. I do it in Isotope. So I can't even remember. I'm thinking of like a, a graphic visualization of what the mouth noise looks like. I don't even think of it in terms of a waveform anymore. It looks like, a, you know, like a crazy like spiky a up and down zigzag. Yeah. It yeah. kind of levels out. Well, you know, on that tip, I was talking with another mastering engineer the other day, and she said, my sibilance is, is like higher than it used to be. Like this, the crazy sibilance we're getting in vocal tracks now is like 10K. It used to be more in the fives and sixes. This is very generally speaking, but mm -hmm. uh, I totally concurred with her on this. Like I'm getting sibilance problems that are much higher on the frequency band than they used to be. And we are trying to figure out like what... What might that be? What's causing us, what's causing these mixes to show up at our mastering studios 
where the sibilance is, you know, so much higher than it used to be. I think it's, um, I think uh, the uh, environmental changes, we just got more helium in there today. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Could be it. Um, okay, cool. So let's talk about isotope. What do you use? How do you use it? Dig in deep if you want. I mean, isotope is pretty amazing. RX just blows me away every time I use it. I actually don't use it enough. I kind of wish I was opening up the app and and doing all these magic tricks in it more often. Um, but you know, it can do these. It can do some pretty incredible things. All day, every day. In so fact, tell, isotope, tell us about what it is. If Isotope ever made like a, a you know a capture loop uh, sort of mini DAW, I would totally use it for my whole workflow. Wow. Um, yeah, I work in Isotope RX8 all the time and use all the tools as needed. But some of my favorites, um, I use the D-click all the time, not just when I'm working on vinyl, but I use the D-click on mouth noise a lot mm -hmm. or bad edits or weird anomalies. So full transparency, not only is Isotope a sponsor on this podcast um, and uh, very likely still for this episode, but I will be using D-Click on our voices while I mix this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Uh, I use the spectral repair constantly to fix any sort of weird anomaly, to fix dropouts. If I'm working on tape and one channel drops out a little bit, um, I use uh, spectral repair for sibilance by hand if it's the kind of song where running a de -er or attempting to EQ out the sibilance is a little too heavy-handed, I will go through second by second. And anytime there's a bit of sibilance that's a little too much, a little spectral repair to chill that out. So now, um, spectral repair is actually opening up the audio in the Isotope app. And you're yeah. talking about going in and seeing the frequencies and using the draw tools to be able to draw these different things out, right? Well, so I'm actually like, I'll draw a little square around the sibilance, whatever frequency it's at, and uh, use the spectral repair attenuator tool to chill it out a little bit. You know, it's like a, it's a subtle move. You'd honestly think I'm so ridiculous for, the, for what I do, like the, mm. the amount of detail I get into, but it makes the difference, you know? Yeah. Well, once again, just go listen, rock stars. <laughs> listen to the playlist. <laughs> Here's your evidence. Um, um, so it, you know, it's amazing. You yeah. Well, I was going to ask you this. I think one of the things that I think spectral repair does is it kind of, you, if you remove something, you think like, well, what's it could just be an empty hole. And I think it takes stuff from nearby that is that doesn't have the bad sound or the click in it, and it just kind of borrows it and reconstructs it in and to well, fill yeah. the hole, right? So there are different ways you can use an interpolator to recreate the little bit that you're taking out. And, what? you know, this is a trial and error thing. This is what I always tell my students. It's not like you go in there and you do it once and you're done. You know, it's like you might do it 15 times to figure out which method of interpolation is going to give you the best results. So it's like the Beatles in the studio doing takes, in other words. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, I was going to tell you an utterly mind-blowing thing with Isotope RX-8. Um, so I had never used this tool before, and I was completely spectacle. Or spectacle? Skeptical. You spectacle. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> you know, it was a spectacle. Um, but uh, their unmixing tool that they have in RX-8, the one right. where you can actually spit out stems, Rebalance. Rebalance. Yeah. The one where you can spit out like a percussion stem and a vocal stem and a bass stem and an other stem. I yeah. used that on a project for which there was one mono source and that was it. That was the recording. Um, I unmixed it, basically rebalanced everything in a DAW and then mastered from my, you know, it was like mastering from stems. And when it recombined, it was glorious. And if you'd listened, if you'd soloed any one of them, you'd hear all the crazy artifacts 
But when you added them back together, even though I had played around with the, the levels, to, you know, to mix it, uh, it just sounded like a new recording. And I was just flabbergasted. I had to call up I the producer it. and be like, I can't believe this worked. I was so skeptical and it worked beautifully. Kudos to you for using bringing the word flabbergasted as a first time. <laughs> 300, over 300 interviews, and I'm pretty sure flab, that's the first use of it. Isotope is flabbergasting. Isotope, please don't remove the flabbergasted word from this podcast. Deflabbergaster. Um, well, that's pretty amazing. you know. And I had Michael Brower on recently also, and he talked about that, where he was essentially remixing a track from stereo. You did it for mono. Could you actually, you, you could even take a, um, elements out and, and pan them potentially and, and sort of stereofy a mono track that way? I didn't. I left it mono. I mean, I guess it would, you know, it's it's not like it's separating the different guitar parts. It's just sort of separating guitar from bass, or maybe that's the other category, from vocal, from drums, right? Yeah. Well, also, like, philosophically, this was a mono recording, and this one, you know, this one specifically wanted to be mono. It needed to be mono. But, you know, philosophically, I'm not a big fan of uh, faking stereo from yeah. mono recordings or faking surround from stereo recordings. Like, I don't have a problem with the technology. I just don't see the point or hear the point. Like, yeah. I love a mono record. It's immersive. It's awesome. I already mentioned the Beatles, so I mean, you know, I was digging totally. myself a hole there. Mono anyway. Beatles. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, so let's see. What else do you want to say about um, Isotope and RX? What are some of the other elements of it that you enjoy using to manipulate and clean up sound? Um, not to manipulate, but I use the, what is it? It's option D. I don't know what the the tool is. The thing that gives you the numbers, I use that one a lot. That gives you the data. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know about that one. Okay, so I can't remember what it's called because, you know, the, the quick key fingers, my fingers just know what to do. But I like to look at it and make sure that I'm peaking where I think I'm peaking, that I don't have any interstitial overs. Gives me like a quick snapshot of what the RMS is. Um, so it's just one of those like data tools where it's like, here's what I hear. Let me confirm that by checking the data. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I guess D for data. Probably. D for data. D yeah. for data. I um, use the fade tools in Isotope a lot. I like the fades. Um, I you like mean, how it's you just can like get, fade out the end of a track kind of thing? Yeah. I, I like how you can get really, really detailed and precise with the way you want the fade to go. Um, you know, when... Uh, when Larry from Tape Op was on the show uh, the first time around, he talked about using RX um, as a as an EQ tool for Pro Tools, where he would actually take a take a track and he just send it over there, and then he like maybe pull out you know feedback frequencies he didn't like in guitars or buzzes and things like that, and then just send it right back into Pro Tools. And I thought that was really compelling too. Sort yeah, of a, for sure. a form of cleanup, but but in the recording process as well. Yeah. And I love like when you're working in the standalone app, if you're doing noise reduction, you can just do it on, you know, the the very, very low end or, you know, a 7K and above. And you don't have to just throw noise reduction at the whole mix. You can parcel it out. You can even do noise reduction over just a, like a tiny little section that's not working, but you don't have to. You don't have to throw the tools at the whole frequency band. Right. Sometimes noise is fine in the song. It's masked. You don't even notice it until you get to that open bridge or whatever where, where the mics were just wide open for a bar. Yeah. And then just address it in that one spot. Yeah. Okay, cool. On that, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. On that tip, you want you want to um you want to know a little trick for remastering from vinyl? We love tricks. We just want as many tricks as you can give us. <laughs> it just made me think of this because, you know, when you're going from from vinyl, a lot of times the bulk of the song sounds great, but you get a quiet part and you can just hear noise. Sometimes yeah. it's hum or it's just surface noise or whatever it is. And I like to use a mid-side EQ and attenuate the low end on the sides only during 
the quiet parts or the very beginning or end of a song just to like etch out that sort of rumbly turntable noise. Ah, interesting. The Envoy Pro Electron is the fastest, toughest, mini-sized, universal portable USB-C SSD that lets you record from anywhere in the galaxy with confidence. With speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second real-world performance, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron gives you high-speed audio data for recording and playback. Take your sessions and sample libraries with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Never worry about the storage and safety of your work again. Find the new OWC Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. I love using Isotope plugins for my music and podcast productions. In fact, you're hearing Ozone and RX on my voice in this podcast episode. And now you can get access to all the Isotope plugins through the new subscription bundle. For only $19.99 per month, Music Production Suite Pro is designed for the serious recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, putting the finishing touches on music, film, and podcasts with fully pro versions of Ozone, RX, Neutron, Nectar, Neoverb, Tonal Balance Control, Visual Mixer, and more more, including free plugin updates. And just for you rock stars, get an extended 30-day free trial subscription at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscription. Going back to that idea of mastering from vinyl, I guess that's part of what I wanted to ask. We were talking about your tools like compression, EQ. I can understand potentially doing some EQing. I mean, I can understand anything you tell us you do. That's fine. <laughs> but I guess my question is, do you use some of the same things that you would use mastering somebody's mix if you're remastering and restoring a project from vinyl? Or is it, is would vinyl typically present us with a correct dynamic and we're, well, I guess levels always just whatever level you set it at is what level you're going to start with. But I mean, how, what are the things that you consider as far as that goes? Like, you know, do you recompress or relimit? Um, do you have to change the, the actual level of the track when you're bringing it in from vinyl to restore it and remaster it? Uh, you know, the answer is always going to be, it depends. Totally depends. Yeah. Um, I can give you an example, though. The Crucifix record that I worked on, uh, another example of missing or misplaced master tapes, original vinyl sounded amazing, really fantastic sounding record. And I digitized the vinyl, and I was working uh, with Matt from the band, and he really wanted the new record to sound like the old record. And the irony there is, it's like you have the old record, but you have to make the digital masters translate to a new cut of the new record so that the new record sounds like the old record. Um, convoluted yet? So yeah. in that one, we did very little EQ because the record sounded good, but the record was quiet, even though, you know, I can't adjust playback levels, obviously, when I'm coming off the turntable. So we did have to use some compression and limiting to get the loudness where we wanted it, to send it to April at Golden Mastering to have the lacquers cut, to be manufactured into vinyl. And after all this like circular process, we wound up with a new record that sounds a heck of a lot like the original record. And that and the new record is it's yeah, so it's vinyl sounding like vinyl. Okay. Yeah. Although for that one, as with many projects these days, I did digital masters and vinyl masters. So the digital masters that are out there on the streaming um, services, I you know they're like a little louder, a little mm -hmm. punchier. Mm -hmm. 
All right, cool. So that's a good reminder just that, you know, you sort of, when you can, it's appropriate to master and adjust for the particular medium and that you're going to end up on. Yeah. Knowing where it's going to go. Dig it. Um, on the topic of noise, again, one of the questions I wrote down was from Best Foot F- Forward by Eric Summer, one of the, the songs in your playlist. And it starts with, you know, guitar, like kind of noise. You you kind of hear room noise. Maybe you hear guitar noise. Maybe there's some tape noise. I don't know if you remember that particular project, but I imagine that's along the lines of what you're talking about, where it's like you have to make an artistic decision about what element of noise is distracting from the music and what is just intentional and part of it? Yeah, I remember that record. It was really fun to work on. And it was so much about like uh, setting a tone or capturing a vibe that made you feel like, a, you know, almost, almost like a live performance vibe. What's live performance? I, I've never heard of that. <laughs> it's been <laughs> so kidding. long, hasn't it? Just kidding. I know. Um, okay, cool. So let's 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 keep jumping around. I've got there's so many cool records that you've done. Um, Errol Garner, tell us about that. How high the moon? Uh, is that the one? Did you recently do that? It's it said remastered in 2020. I think. Um, unless yeah. I'm getting that wrong. So I have been working with the Errol Garner estate, the Errol Garner Jazz Project, for a bunch of years now. And that's one that landed at the Magic Shop when I was there. So um, here's the utterly cool thing you should know about Errol Garner. His longtime manager, Martha Glazer, saved everything. Bless her for saving the tapes. Yeah. And um, she passed away and left the estate to her niece, who collaborated with Steve Rosenthal at the Magic Shop to work on the preservation side of things. So we got in box after box after box of tapes of Errol Garner studio recordings, live recordings. We had uh, analog tape, we had cassettes, we had dats, we had discs, and we digitized and preserved them all for this archive. But through that process, we found the master tapes for the Concert by the Sea, which was one of his best-selling, most famous releases. Remastered that one. That's the one that uh, got the Grammy nomination, and I could talk about the joy of working on that forever. Congrats Um, on that. (laughs) Thank you. But we continued working on recordings from his collection. So um, in partnership with Mac Avenue, we released a bunch of records last year, and I remastered, I think, six of them. Wow. Um, Spanning his career, some with strings, some in mono, some stereo, just like a great variety of recordings. And at the core of it all is Errol and his piano playing, which I now know so well I could probably pick it out of a crowd anywhere. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, One of my questions around that was just how challenging is a great piano sound? Um, You know, it's a percussive instrument. Do you have distortion challenges and and sort of peaking transient challenges that go with that? Am I thinking about it too hard? Uh, Yes and no. I mean, it's coming off of tape. So what you need there is an ideal tape transfer. And at this point, I just have to give all the props to Jamie Howarth and John Chester of Plangent Processes who've done the tape transfers and the speed correction. And... It makes all the difference. And I'll tell you, like, you know, having had the the joy of hearing, like, a straight-up good tape transfer and then what they do with plangent processes, where you'll hear it most of all, I think, is in those high piano notes that just Mm -hmm. will ring like a bell. You know, the clarity and the stability of that is just um, ethereal. Wow. So start with the great tape transfer— And then, you know, my job is to sort of um, sculpt it so it makes sense in the contemporary music landscape. So um, I love a good warm piano sound. I think that's one of the things that I've really taken away from working on so many Errol Garner recordings. Mm -hmm. I just love when it's like, feels like you're sitting next to the open piano 
and all those sounds are just filling the room. Uh, you know, it's funny. It reminds me of uh, one of the first records I did was all analog. It was two inch sixteen track, and we had recorded the stuff up at um, at one studio in Nashville, and then it went down to Jackson, Mississippi, to continue or to mix. And the first thing the producer noticed, uh, which was, I'm glad he noticed it, was that the sounds just didn't, they were missing something when we brought them down to Jackson. And it turned out that what was missing was uh, we needed to adjust the azimuth of the tape heads as part of the alignment process down there. And I had to go back and it was something goofy, but like I basically had to reprint tones and um, and then I'd go down and adjust the azimuth of tape heads. And once we did that, it's like you said, it just came to life. Now, it's uh, probably what we were doing isn't nearly as high tech as what these guys are doing for these transfers. But, you know, you make a great point. It's like the turntable. You really have to get the mechanics of the reproduction right, and it will just completely bring to life the sound. Yeah, it will. I mean, azimuth, it's important. And if it's not aligned... <laughs> yeah. You lose that that high end. You lose the clarity in the high end. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Any other challenges around that particular project and doing all the different, you know, going through this whole career? Um, do you ever need to address things like panning and stereo width and stuff like that? Because I noticed that there was some, you know, that particular record. I think with the "How High the Moon" track on it had some great, like, hard panned congas and percussion over to the right, pianos sort of in the middle other instruments? Yeah. I mean, those are things I talk about with the producers because uh, this is an instance where you're being true to the way it was recorded and presented in that time. And sure, like to, if you made a recording today, no one would hard pan those things, but that's what that record is. So we're being true to what that record was intended to be originally. Do you sometimes have to address panning and stereo width and things like that in, in the mastering process? I don't know that I've done it much with the Errol Garner recordings because for the most part, by the time they get to me, they sound pretty terrific coming off the tape. And I'm not messing much with what Martha Glazer approved when this recording was originally issued. Um, but with other recordings, absolutely, I'm constantly playing around with you know, narrowing things if they're just uh, too wide and feeling really diffuse or imbalanced. Um, probably less so do I ever widen things that are narrow. I'm trying to mm -hmm. think of an example of that. What about but, guitars? I feel like that's a question that could come up with guitar bands where you just want that wall of guitar sound. Yeah, I mean, I guess sometimes like a little kiss of widening can help with that. Um but I feel like I don't actually do that all that often. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you answered the question, even though I re-asked it, you had already <laughs> answered it. So that was my answer. I mean, more often, you know, since I know you love cassettes, more often what will happen is I'll get a cassette that is, uh, you know, ha has had some life, is maybe not in the best shape. And sometimes you get a little crazy imbalance between the left and the right and um, narrowing that stereo field can help yeah, things it, focus in a little more. It spent a lot of time living in the tour bus, in other words. Uh, you know, or like under a bed, in a basement, in the backyard. I don't know. Yeah. Um, another artist you work with, um, Kodoma, Ashes Along the River, Even Gods Can Die, is a heavy rock record. And I wanted to ask you, so that one does have some some big distorted guitars and stuff. And I wanted to yeah. ask how how is mastering similar or different for a project like that than it is um, to a project like Nahawa Dumbaya, if I'm pronouncing that right. Great, great Afropop or the Errol Garner records. Well, you know, sometimes it's uh, a matter of trying to give the impression of an ideal live performance, and sometimes you are sculpting this imagined sonic landscape. So with Even Gods Can Die, oh my God, we had so much fun just like getting aggressive, compressing it, 
EQing it, throwing all sorts of stuff at it to make it sound like a wall of sound, but still, you know, with that, the right kind of energy and the right kind of dynamic interplay between the different instruments. That one was super fun to work on. That's cool. Um, you know, you've also done all these great Afropop things, so I'm going to pivot to that as well. Uh, how did you get involved in a project like Dada, uh, how do I say it? Didadi? Um, Nahawa Dumbaya? Or Dumba, Dumbia? I think it's Dumbia. It's so good. Um, okay. It's just so good sounding. It's so good. And it's actually really uh, lyrically important, too. I, I know we don't always understand the lyrics, but if you read more about it, um, you know, it's a very socially conscious record. Yeah, so beautiful singing. This one beautiful goes voices. back, and I honestly consider this like the honor of my career. But um, many, many years ago, I connected with Brian Shimkovitz, who runs the label Awesome Tapes from Africa. This is back before it was a label, when it was just a blog. And nice. he um, had me remaster Hailu Mergia's Hailu and his classical instrument, the first release on his label, which coincidentally I listened to again recently just for another reason. And that record still sounds so great. I'm honestly like so proud of that record. Um, Is that we one are, that we included in your playlist here? I don't know if it's in the playlist, but it's a great one. Sure. Right. But we're like, I don't I don't know how many projects we're in now, 20, something like that. We've done so many records together over the years, and I'm just so honored that I have been entrusted with remastering the records so that the world can hear these things that previously circulated in much smaller regions. Um, and it's been, you know, it's like, so many different genres within this huge umbrella of African music. Mm -hmm. So we've done records from Ethiopia with Hailu. You know, I did this South African techno record. Oh, one of my other favorites was that was Tenno from, Africa. Yeah, that one's great. Um, yeah, and one of my cool other favorites stuff. was from the Ivory Coast. And it's this kind of like sweet, almost psych country birds ish record. Um, by Jess Sabi and Peter One. I just love that record. Um, so these are, a bunch of these are recordings that happened quite a while ago that are getting restored and remastered as opposed to a brand new record? It's or, actually a Or is mix. it a combination? Some of them are newer, uh, contemporary recordings that just have not uh, reached a worldwide audience. And then some of them we're digging back and pulling from vinyl or cassette. How do you get low end to sound great for a record like um, uh, Privacy Invaders, Occurrence, or Ambassadors from Tenno Africa? Oh, that one's fun. Um, I've been but those, playing you around. You put those bass traps in the corners, right? <laughs> bass traps help. The the headphones are are good for uh, monitoring and making sure everything's cool. Um, I do like the Ozone low end. What's that low-end tool? I can't remember what it's uh, called. I'll pull it up. It's here. one of those um, machine learning low-end tools that I think of as like adjusting the contrast yeah, low and end intensity. Focus. Yeah, low-end low focus. End focus. So I've been playing with that a bit, like pretty lightly. Um, I, th I think when I'm working on a record like that, what you'll find is that my EQ settings get fairly complex because it's not just about like, oh, a little boost, a little cut. It winds up being very surgical sculpting to get the body that I want without anything sort of overflowing and becoming too flubby. So what does it do? What does it sound like when you start adjusting that plugin? What do you hear? With low-end focus? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to play around with. It's... Um, it's really subtle. I mean, though, I guess the way I use it, it's really subtle because I'm not particularly heavy-handed when it comes to pretty much anything that I'm doing. I mean, that's the nature of mastering, right? It's all very incremental, small moves. Um, mm -hmm. But it's mostly about trying to find the right clarity as you're bringing the level of the song all the way up. Like, you know, if you just turn a song up or if you just slap a limiter on it, everything comes up. And that's, that's when you get sections of the song that just feel very overpowering and sort of smother yeah. other parts of the song. So playing around with the low-end focus 
is a way to dial in in a really sophisticated, dynamic way the very specific relationships of the different bass sounds, like the different notes a bass player might be playing or the different low-end uh, percussion sounds. Rock stars, I am super excited to announce that I'm doing a full studio remodeling here at the Toy Box Studio, headquarters of Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm working with the amazing studio designer, Carl Tatz, to upgrade my control room to a phantom Focus mix room, and have also been improving the sound of my entire studio room by room. The first time I heard one of Carl's phantom Focus mix rooms featuring the PFM HD 1000 series monitors, I was completely blown away. It felt like I was listening to three-dimensional sound where I could close my eyes and reach out and touch the instruments with crystal clear bass radiating from a 50-foot wall of pure marble. It was by far the best sounding mix room monitors I have ever heard anywhere. Check out my complete interview with Carl Tatz on episode 50 of the podcast and discover the secret to massively improving your monitor setup at carltatzdesign.com slash mixroom dash mentor. Where, when somebody's mixing, do you think they might incorporate low-end focus to get the most bang for their buck? Would it be on the bass instruments directly? Would it be sort of across the two mix in a way? Well, in a way, I feel like if you are recording it optimally, you wouldn't need it. But I know that's not, it's not but realistic. So, so it's a great, I mean, you're obviously your experience is as a restoration tool. Yeah. But it's really <laughs> useful for that. But probably like, a, you know, on a, on a bus stem or a, a bus stem, a drums stem or a drums bus, it could help you um, just kind of ratchet up the clarity. And sometimes what we're doing is, you know, we're creating a sound that doesn't exist in the real world. So it can be as like uh, sort of compartmentalized as we want it to if you're playing in the digital realm. What are some of the things that you have found yourself thinking about that if you could communicate to the mixers out there, I really wish you all would do this a little better or more of this so that it would, you know, mastering would sound better. Are there any sort of commonalities that you find that would be helpful to, to teach right now? <laughs> this comes up in teaching more than in my mastering work because, yeah. because of the genres I tend to work on and because I... I'm lucky I work with a lot of really great mixing engineers. Just turn those hi-hats down. <laughs> hi-hats are always, they're like 6 dB too loud. Turn them down. If you think they're too nice. loud, they are too loud. Now, are we talking about like hi-hats in a rock band thing, or are we talking about hi-hats in a trap production? More in a trap production. You know, like okay. any sort of 808 style hi-hat is just yeah. like a knife. And I, this is something I work on with my students. I'm like, yes, it's exciting. It's a really cool texture. It's too loud. Why do you think it gets ends up too loud? Is it just because it's exciting and people like to turn up things that are exciting? And maybe, probably, or maybe, maybe because we're working fatigue. at loud volume too. Yeah, yeah, working at loud volumes, ear fatigue, or just not recognizing that. At a mix level, it may seem okay, but when you start mastering and you're bringing up the overall level of everything, mm -hmm. those hi-hats like shoot through the roof. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good reminder right there. And again, the listening volume discussion, which is if we've been working on something for a while, the first thing that starts to become uh, less exciting to us is the brightness in our mix. And so we can have a tendency to want to brighten things up more and cranking up the high hats some more would would probably qualify as that, as doing that. It would qualify. Um, okay, cool. So another track. Um, this song is for whoever feels lonely. Palenque Soul Tribe. This one kind of reminds me of the Tom Tom Club meets like Reggae Tron, but they also had an Atari Twenty Six Hundred to make their sounds. <laughs> it's a great sounding record and super fun yeah. to listen to. Tell us about that one. You know what I remember about that one? You know how sometimes, well, maybe not because you're not a mastering engineer. Sometimes I get some mixes and I master them and I think it sounds great and I send it off and it just gets approved and it goes out the door. And then sometimes I master it and I think it sounds great and the producer or the band or the engineer will hit me back and say like, we really want uh, this revision. We need to, a little more clarity in the low end. We need a little more this or that, right? Whatever the specific things are. 
Mm-hmm. And with Palenque Soul Tribe, we actually went through several rounds of revisions, and each time it made the record better. And I was so grateful to work with people who were totally cool being critical and asking for what they wanted and, you know, essentially demanding that I continue to work at this until we locked in the sound that they wanted. It was a really rewarding collaborative experience, and I think the record sounds better because of it. It does sound great. Which, you know, that's to say, like— if you hear something, ask for revisions. That's what we're here for. Like we're here to to revise and make things and refine and make things sound as good as they can. Let's talk a little bit about um, the most effective ways for a producer, a mixing you know team to communicate with the mastering engineer to get the most out of it. You must have experience with the difference between a really specific, helpful revision request and just the the stressed out look, <laughs> worried look in somebody's face because they don't know what it is that they, they um, are asking for. Uh, what, what, what are some good, you know, um, revision and communication tips that you want to share about working with a mastering engineer? Well, one of my favorite revisions I've ever gotten, this was a, a live piano, drums, bass, trio. And the producer said, I feel like I'm sitting next to the drummer and I want to sit next to the pianist. And I was like, I get that. I totally get it. I'm going to do some EQ compression trickery to, to chill out the drums and allow the piano to be more of a focal point. I thought that was just such a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. I like creative feedback like that. Yeah. But you know, not not everyone has the language to describe what they want. So I feel like it is my job to be the interpreter. And sometimes that means getting on the phone and talking through it and saying, okay, like, what are you feeling about this? What doesn't feel right about it? Um, Another one I got recently that, again, I was like, perfect. I know exactly what to do. Um, This was sort of a, like a reggae track. And the band came back and said, it sounds great, but we want uh, 70s reggae. We want the the low end to be a little more chill, not 2020s reggae. And I was like, again, I get it. I know exactly what you want. Chilled out the low end a little bit. Bass was a little more subdued in the master. And away we went. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I remember getting mixed feedback once from the artist and he said, Imagine you're walking down a path, and out of the corner of your eye, you see a fairy in the tree, and you turn to look, but the fairy is gone, and all you see is the pixie dust that was left behind. (laughs) See, I I could get that, though. I get it. I was like, yes. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do now, but I I still like making records with you. (laughs) They want airiness. They want that, like... Yeah. Um. I had a client once say it, and I use this example in my class because I think it's really important. Um, I had a client say she wanted her mix to sound like sushi. And, you know, the setup there is everyone's like, oh, you know, what does that mean? It's meaningless. It's not. She wanted everything to sound very individualized and precise, but that it worked perfectly as a single bite. And I got that. She wanted a, a really specific clarity among the instruments in her mix. That's cool. Um, there was another project, another African one you worked with, um, Coco Ara, if I'm saying that right, Angel from DJ Caterpillar. Yeah. What What is that project? It's got these hilarious high pitched voices going on. It sounds It sounds a little bit like somebody just got their first drum machine, but it's just cool. You know, it's cool, and it, and it just yeah. There's a bunch of great stuff on there. That's what I love about so many of the records I get from Awesome Tapes. Um, There's this real, like, uh, lack of posturing with it. It's Mm -hmm. just freaking fun. And sometimes it's really silly, and sometimes it can be actually really profound or a mix of both. But uh, at the core, it just feels like people are having a great time making music. Yeah. Um, And that's that comes out in the way that sometimes these artists are 
breaking the rules or what we would think of as rules of how you produce a song. I felt like a mixtape. It, it reminded me, this isn't trying to follow the three-minute pop song arrangement. This is trying to create, you know, like a long-form mixtape kind of thing that is meant to be playing in the, of, you know, in the communal space where everybody's hanging out and it just, it lifts the mood and makes you feel good. Yeah. I mean, it's a good reminder that, you know, a lot of the, this music was not really meant to be listened to, you know, in your car or while you're washing dishes. It's, it's party music. You should be yeah. in a group of people dancing and talking and drinking and doing drugs and hanging out and having a good time. Indeed. Um, and hopefully we'll all get to do that at some point pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, here we go. So what's the craziest thing you've had to restore? Um, you know, is it like uh, um, surveillance tapes or anything like that? If you, you know, you're, are you uh, decoding wiretaps from the bunker? I am not, although I could. I actually have not done forensics work, but I love That's that the movie, uh, the Gene Hackman movie. The, what was that? The, was con- the conversation. Where in, in, just go watch it. Um, All, right. All right. The craziest thing I've had to restore, though, um, I you know it's probably something from Awesome Tapes. It's that seems like a logical <laughs> conclusion. Yeah. Um, some crazy cassette that was a dub of a dub of a dub. You know that. It was almost like the sounds are just obliterated and you have to do your best to figure out what's there. Well, it's pretty remarkable what's possible now. Um, you know, I actually did get somebody, somebody I think even paid me maybe um, many years ago, probably 95 or something to do forensic work. It was a tape that was going to be used in a courtroom and there was just background fan noise, and they wanted us to remove it so it was make make it easier to hear the voices. And we didn't have all these tools that we had now. Um, but my roommate and I, we tried to do it, and we we all we did it was just like do some EQing. And I couldn't, I, for the life of me, I couldn't make it sound any better than it did. Um, so, congrats to you on being able to do all those things now, because <laughs> well, uh, the tools get better. The tools are way better now than they were even. Five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that rebalance thing is really, I, I need to dig in more and, and try that out on some stuff. Yeah. Game changer. Yeah. I'm, I've definitely got some mixes out there where I could probably, you know, do some vocal ups or get the bass to sound a lot better. Um, very cool. I, I, we're kind of coming to the end here. Let me, let me uh, see. Let me ask you a couple other questions before we roll out. Um, Talk about how you find clients for restoration and mastering. What 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 works for you? What tips do you want to share with the rock stars about how to find people to work with these days? Oh, it's all word of mouth. It's all, I did a record for someone and they passed my name on to someone else. I think, honestly, probably 90% of my work is word of mouth. And then maybe someone... Googled a record that they liked and realized that I'd done the remastering. Yeah, I feel like that's still the case for me. I mean, I've had website success in the past. Um, I haven't really tried to make my website approach, you know, very 2021 with email lists and all that kind of stuff for my studio, but I have had people contact me because they, you know, find me through Google. But like you said, it's it's primarily always been, if I do a great job with somebody, then somebody else hears about it or finds out about it and they are looking for somebody to help them make a record. And so they connect with me, you know? Yeah. And I like that way of working. I mean, it shows that I'm dedicated to what I'm doing and, you know, I have a certain work ethic. And if you pass on my name, that should indicate some level of trust and what I'm able to do. I'll say that. And yeah, go ahead. Another, another way that I sometimes get work is that a fellow mastering or restoration engineer will have a, a project that they can't take on because of a time constraint or just for some other reason, and they'll throw it my way. And I love that too. And I've done the same. I've returned the favor because 
we are a small community and so many of us are friends. So there's this real lack of ego and competition there. It's like, if someone needs the record and I can't do the turnaround because I'm booked, I'll toss it to a friend. And then they might throw something back my way. I think that goes into the humbleness, kindness, and collaboration in our industry category. Yeah. So what what does it mean to be humble and kind in, in what we do? You know, at the end of the day, I am really just trying to be a, a positive force in our industry. And I take a lot of the ego out of it. I have never made a record myself. I'm not a recording artist. I don't sing. I'm a terrible guitar player. So every project that comes through my studio, someone else put their heart and soul into it and their blood, sweat, and tears. So I have just enormous respect for that. And I I try to keep that as a focal point in my work. Someone else worked so hard on this. I need to respect that and what I'm doing and respect that my peers are doing the same thing. They're doing amazing work. So the fact that we can all just be like decent people, making stuff sound good, sharing music with the world. I mean, what what better career could you ask for than that? I feel very lucky. It is lucky. I mean, it's one of those things... um... You know, I, I I have a I just got a book in the mail from Bill Schnee. His his new book came out, and in his opening preface, he just he brings that up again. It's just like how lucky we are to do what we love, and you never work a day in your life. Who cares if it's a cliche? You know, it's just it's a great way to be working and doing what we do and and live and and love it. Yeah, it doesn't mean I don't get tired after a long day, or sometimes want to kick a project out the window if I'm really struggling with it. But, you know, someone else put their heart into it. So it's my job to respect that and honor yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and I, I find that the more uh, the more I do this, the more I understand and appreciate that. And the more I'm open to, you know, understanding that somebody else's idea, even if I don't get it, or even if I might think it's just blatantly obvious that something's wrong with it from my perspective if you hold back and just wait and and you know have that respect you more often than not can be just, uh, surprised at how wrong you were and how there was something there you know i mean sometimes sometimes there's something wrong with stuff but um you know people wouldn't be there with their music working with you if they didn't have a vision that they were pursuing themselves yeah, and if if I feel like they have not achieved their vision the way they should at the mix stage, you know, part of being a kind person is being able to call up the mix engineer and have like a really straightforward and honest conversation about some mix issues that yeah would make the project better if they were addressed at the mix stage. And you know, I I do that all the time as part of my practice. I'm you know that's part of the collaboration of making a record. Yeah. Want to know how to record killer drums in your studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with examples from Nashville session drummers in a Grammy-winning studio. Want to know how to master your own music at home? Rockstars of Mastering will show you how with plugins in your DAW so that your music will sound awesome when you finish your mixes. And if you're looking for a step-by-step solution for a pro mix that won't take years to learn, Ultimate Mixing Masterclass with Craig Alvin will show you a proven method for creating Grammy-winning quality mixes that you can apply in your home studio right now. Or if you just need to learn the fundamentals of a great mix, then register for my free course, Mix Master Bundle, to get great mixes using simple, free plugins. Get started now making your best record ever at recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy. Use the code ROCKSTAR to get 10% off any course in the academy for a limited time. Talk about specializing versus being a generalist in audio production. How do you think that could help us out? I mean, you seem to have chosen a specialty yourself. 
I did. And that was a little bit of luck because I stumbled into working in the restoration world, but a lot of recognizing that it was something that aligned with my temperament and my skills and my ability to work at high levels of detail and um, just kind of knowing myself, that was a good fit for me. But I think when you look at the economic landscape of the music industry these days, there are reasons to be a specialist and reason to be a Jack or Jill of all trades. But um, for me, specializing was a way to be the person that you call if you need something reissued from vinyl or some cassette transfers or, um, you know, if you're working on a new record and you've got some far out noisy thing that you need to work with an engineer who can kind of understand that aesthetically and not try to reshape it into something that it's not, you know, obviously there are tons of people who can do that, but like, that's why I get the calls. Yeah. Um, well, let me jump into some of our closing questions here too. What was some of the best advice you re remember receive receiving or was there somebody that was a real influence for you initially as far as being a mentor or an inspiration? I think the best advice, I have two pieces of good advice. And one is listen. And that's totally obvious, but you can get so sidetracked by the gear and the stories and the fame and the awards and the money and all that rock and roll and forget to connect with the sounds. And that comes from Steve Rosenthal with The Magic Shop. Because I remember him telling me once about a meeting he had with someone about their audio archive. And I guess they'd met with several people about who was going to do the digitizing work. And he was the only one who asked to hear the music. He wanted, he wanted to listen to it. He wanted to know what it was all about. And that made a huge impact on me when I was working at the magic shop. Like that reminder that our job is to listen. But the other piece of advice I have is to spell everything correctly. <laughs> nice. And I, thought you, I thought you were going to say, listen, but when you hear something, do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, my other advice is about spelling because this uh, work demands attention to detail and respect. So I'm just really particular about spelling people's names correctly and spelling their song titles correctly. Th yeah, that's a lesson I've learned the hard way too. And uh, hopefully I've learned it at this point. But, um, it can be a challenge, especially, you know, I'm, I'm older now, you know, 53 and I have to wear reading glasses and sometimes just my ability to read the words clearly. I have to slow myself down and really like methodically check spelling to not screw it up. Yeah, it's so a good I can, reminder. I can that understand. We, we do need to slow down sometimes. Like I know how easy it is to fall into this like mad dash. Oh, I got to get this stuff out the door. Uh, but you know what? Slow down. Yeah, I find that when it comes to spelling and getting things right, too, um, leaning on other people to help you prove things is really helpful. So, again, another lesson learned the hard way was uh, having to do credits on a record and accidentally leaving off a friend of mine who played bass on a track mm, who was yeah. very proud of it and really excited about it. I felt awful. And the lesson for me was how easy would it have been for me to just bounce that off some other trusted eyeballs before I actually submitted it, you know? Yeah. And email away. All right. Uh, would you like to share a, a thought on a resource, uh, you know, either advice or a resource for the business side of what we do um, in case we want to make records for a living and not just for a hobby? Oh yeah. Okay. Gear is wonderful. I love gear. I spend way too much money on gear, but um, something I use every day that's so simple that I love. I love Google Sheets. I love making really elaborate spreadsheets for my projects so I can uh, collaborate with people, so I can create like really detailed inventories and collect metadata and use controlled vocabularies and document everything. Google Sheets. And do you use Google Forms to kind of collect the information from your clients? No, I like to create um, formulas in my Google Sheets so I can uh, 
use the same language to describe uh, a bunch of different tapes. You know, like I want to know if it's a quarter inch tape and it's a stereo tape and it runs at seven and a half inches per second. I want the same language used for every instance of that. Right. Did you, um, do you have a formula for a Mo Beta button that I could maybe use in my studio? <laughs> I'll make one for you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, cool. So Google Sheets is great. Uh, do you have anything regarding just how you organize the folders themselves within your master drive folder? Sometimes I find that's the challenge. I'm like, what what folder does this idea go in? And then I end up with like, you know, five folders that have different similar names and different locations. And I'm like, crap, where did Ooh, that put that thing? Dangerous game. Uh, well, shout out to the Recording Academy producers and engineer wing for uh, creating documents to help us with deliverables for music projects. I use templates, by which I mean on my work drive, I have a folder called, I call it AAAA template. So it's always at the top. And you sort alphabetically. And within that, I have folders for a mastering project that are pre-made, like a series of nested folders for the mastering session and the deliverables and the mixes and any notes. And then I have a folder that I called XDNU, meaning do not use. And that's my parking lot for old mixes or, you know, masters that didn't quite work or anything that's like junk, but you don't want to delete it. So every new project gets all the nested folders and they are just there waiting to be filled. So AAA template, is that something that you duplicate and then you just give it the title and now you've got all these nested folders for everything that would yeah. be needed for that project? That's Every smart. time it's, a project comes in. Yeah, because that's how Pro Tools would do it if I make a new Pro Tools session. It makes a folder with a series of folders in it. I like that. Smart smart tip, Jessica. Very helpful. You're, you'll always know where everything is. Yeah. Okay. Go groovy. Great idea. Um, and then, uh, then I guess otherwise it would be, would you save things in folders based on label or based on artist? It depends a little bit. You know, for example, Awesome Tapes has their own label folder because I have dozens of projects within that. But if it's just an artist where I've done, you know, one project with them, artist name. Okay, cool. Great. I think that's a challenge in my studio for recall photos, it's like, what do you call this batch of photos right here? Where did they go in the song title? Do they go in the artist title? Do they go under the date? You know, things like that. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're going to the, the uh, closing question here. This is hypothetical, but you're going to take the Wayback Studio machine and you go, and you know, it's appropriate because you're actually going back to a magic shop. So, you know, I think like you probably pass Harry Potter in the ether sphere or something on your way <laughs> over there, you know, in some kind of like ta um, uh, Doctor Who tunnel up in space. But uh, you're going to go back in time and you find young Jessica and you say, I guess in this case, you wouldn't say, hey, dude, you would say, hey, girl, or how, how would you address yourself if you went back in time? Hey, girl, sounds nice. Okay. All right. Hey, girl. You need to, uh, here's this, I've come back in time to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single thing that you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give, it was a really long preamble, wasn't it? What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? I guess it depends a little bit on how far back we're going. If we're going well, back yeah, 20 years, choose. if we're going back 20 years, I would say, trust the process. It takes a long time to get good at this craft and you just have to do it and you have to practice every day and you are going to master hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of records and still think you suck at it, but you don't. Trust the yes, process. You're right. learning. If we're going back 10 years, I'm going to say, Jessica, learn to mix on that Neve console. I mean, why, I'll tell you, I mean, I know why I bypassed that opportunity because I was mastering and I had two kids while I was at the magic shop. So I was always like pregnant or had a little one at home. If I had to go back five years, <laughs> buy a bigger house, you know, right. buy a bigger house, 
That's the big struggle in my life right now. Like build your studio out at home because I asked so many of my friends who are in my same position and everyone who's really developing a viable business as a mastering engineer, they all built home studios. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm still doing it. Uh, I'm glad that I did it. I, I got some advice from, you know, people who'd been doing this longer than me that they thought it was a smart move to do. And uh, I don't know if you've been following our Save Home Studios battle here in Nashville, but uh, we just made a big change here in Nashville last year to legalize yeah. home studios for everybody. So that was a big, um, that just felt great. Uh, I heard and kudos to all the people who worked so hard to make that happen. Yeah, thank you. That was really, uh, that was something fun to win at in 2020. Yeah, we needed one. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for hanging with us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Just a blast to ch- chat with you. Again, what, you know, when we hang up, I'll probably just go turn on your playlist again and keep listening to all these great records. And Rockstars, I encourage you to scroll down in the show notes and you'll find links to the um, audio playlist, Spotify playlist, to go check out this stuff. Where would you like the Rockstars to go learn more about you online, find you if they need to get their next, you know, we definitely have listeners who have old tapes and they're like, man, I really want to remaster and re-release these tapes from my early band years. Uh, where should they go to contact you? Oh, you can find me at jessicathompsonaudio.com. That's, I can. I don't know if I can remember that. <laughs> Just That's a good <laughs> one. Well done. It's- It has been such a pleasure talking to you. I just want to thank you for inviting me to be on this. You're so welcome. And uh, thank you again to Ian Brennan for connecting us. Jessica, be well. I hope you get to have coffee with my my buddy Matt sooner out there than I do. And um, I look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, let's hope we can all get coffee together sometime soon. Let's do it. And let's hope that it's good coffee too, because that always It better be. Yeah. (laughs) All right, cheers. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Carl Tatz Design, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plug-in purchase or use the coupon ROCKSTARS at jzmic.com for 20% off the pop filter for a limited time. And don't forget to learn how to get your monitoring just right at carltatsdesign.com slash mixroom dash mentor. And finally, use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. We'll include all these links in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.